Welcome inside the Parisi Palace, high above 3773 East Broadway. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. Company on Power Talk, thank you so much for making us part of your day today. And I've been talking recently to a, a dear friend and elder, Jim Keltner, quite a bit. And uh, the other day I, I asked him, I said, you know, I, I just cannot go any longer without speaking to one of the most sanctified individuals of all time uh i said you know i this guy who uh just leans on the organ like it's some sanctified church in the middle of rural tennessee or alabama i said where is spooner oldham and jim said well let me just give you his number right now and you know he did and i called him and in that sort of very you know non- egotistical very just sort of very light airy and wonderful attitude um it was just so good to hear his voice he's made such an impact on so many records that uh my generation and older generations have lived off of for years playing little parts and serving the song and uh and really being a conduit uh, for information coming through him from the heavens and uh just what an honor, Spooner Oldham. Welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Hi, Jay. Yeah, it's uh, good to be here. I miss being in New York City and Brooklyn. And last time I went to Brooklyn, it was uh, do a recording session with Cat uh, Power or Chan Marshall. Oh, you're not in Brooklyn, though, are you? Well, I'm, I mean, my roots are in Long Island. I mean, I grew up in that, Long, Island, in Long yeah. Island, but I mean, I moved out. I live in Tucson now and uh, found my voice out here. You know, Spooner, I, I just wanted to ask you about um, coming in. Like, did you have an opportunity to stand outside a sanctified church? What was the closest thing as a boy that you got? to the sanctified church well i don't know of what you speak of sanctified church i can give you my background um what i'm saying when i say uh, sanctified i mean like uh you know not kind of non more more uh more southern baptist black with uh guitars and rhythm in the church not a lot of choral reading but you had holy rollers people falling and i'm not saying it was a church you attended but I just wonder if it was the rhythms and the and the groove, because those people were introducing the blues to their congregation, which was considered devil's music. But just based on who you fell in with early on in your career and listening to you religiously live with Bob Dylan, it just sounds like you were in that setting. And I just or I wasn't sure how close you ever got to that. Not really. I, I played piano occasionally in the church I grew up in and was a member of called the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, which is pretty much straight for read from the song book, nothing but piano and or organ and sometimes a choir. And the other thing, I'd go with my grandmother sometimes to a, a Baptist church, same story, no no music instruments, except piano and organ. Uh, once or twice, I drove down from Center Star, Alabama, where I grew up, a uh, small town, North Alabama, to, and there was a black church down there at the, at the bottom, I call it, a few streets down, and and a couple of times I'd park out in the parking lot on a Sunday morning, and, and I could tell the difference in 
what they did and what I was used to hearing. But but first of all, I hate the blues. You know, I've got a new song. Hope nobody copies it. <laughs> I haven't played it to anybody. <laughs> and, uh, you know, some guy, Dan Penn and I were doing a festival in Europe, and uh, some, some guy came up to me. I could tell he was a journalist. Uh, and he said, he gave me a name. What do you think about blah, blah, blah? I, said, I didn't recognize him. I guess it was an old bluesman. Sure. I don't study. And I said, I don't know. You have to, I pointed somebody across. So you need to go talk with him. I don't know much about the blues. <laughs> no, okay. So I want, but you know what I want? Because you, you just said it. Tell me and tell the audience, so important. What was, what were you hearing that was the difference between the black church at the bottom versus your Sunday services that you would play at? Well, you know, they would, they would uh, say a sentence in the, in the congregation a lot, especially the men, amen, amen. Uh, I never heard that much, uh, you know. So they were uh, involved with actually the, this, the process of preaching themselves, you know. I was used to people shut up and be quiet kind of attitude you know i dig so you're talking about the congregation kind of call and response a lot of clapping yeah 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 yeah. of course i was familiar with call and response to ray charles what i say sure i understand he wrote that song pretty much on the spot in atlanta live recording and told the raylettes to uh just just repeat what i say you know (laughs) i'll say something (laughs) so that was the call and response attitude you know but I never, I never lived on anything. To be honest, I I grew up with a lot of music on the radio. Sure. I didn't buy any records. And my dad and his two brothers had a band. And I thought everyone grew up with a band in their house or out in the yard in the summer under a shade tree. Uh, but I learned soon that you know nobody, hardly anybody, had a band in their house. So, but um, well, let me ask you. I mean, I mean, were you? What was, were you in? I mean, even though you didn't were in, at the at the black church, I mean, did you feel like? Uh, I, I guess where did your soul grow? I mean, were you were you? There's no answer, Jay. There's no answer. You know, I can't answer that because uh, I grew up with God in my heart and mind. Yes, but it has nothing to do with anything or anybody else. It's just me and Him. You know what I mean? personal relationship absolutely no and i appreciate that because everybody has their own personal i just wanted to know when you recognize like what like if you could talk about playing with your dad under that shade tree i mean were you playing gospel no i didn't no i didn't play with them they were grown men and i was a little child you know i just listened and that's where i got part of my inspiration to Try to do his music, but for instance, my granddaddy Archie Snoddy, he built my mom and dad's house 50 years ago out in the country. And when we finished, he was a carpenter, uh, and I he taught me how to nail a nail. To, you know, he showed me a little piece of the wall, and we screed the basement, the concrete, level it. He said, "You get over there and get over here," and he had a two by twelve piece of board, and would level the concrete that came out of the truck poured down the steps and (laughs) just you know i was 10 or 12 years old well when the house was finished the furniture came in there the living room sofa and my granddad sitting there i was 10 or 12 he's he was in his 70s he said uh what do you think you're going to do lyndon when when you grow up kind of question i said music so i had already made up my mind to try to survive in the music world didn't know how because there wasn't a whole lot of people referencing you know i didn't i couldn't say that guy down the street did it i can do it so i had no point of reference except my dad and his band were really good but it was broken up by world war ii battle of the bulls in his case wow and he came home from that all right but he had a a brain uh blood clot on the brain from an injury in his head and it later a year later it uh hemorrhaged and paralyzed his right arm and leg so he had to give up music i guess he's 21 years old at that point would you, you say know? that so what, I, what was the kind of music that your dad's band was playing so i i wish many times i i did have a little tape recorder at one point but i never recorded anything and um, 
Well, it was probably a it was a odd mixture that I've never heard before or since. But bluegrass, country, uh, western swing. Oh my God! I, folk, I wish folk. you God break the tape recorder out, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean it was an odd mix, and they they did a lot of uh, Lubin Brothers, Delmar Brothers songs, and um, uh, you know Porter Wagner, which had written this song called Satisfied Mind. Sure. And uh, so you know they were drawn from a, a, the well they loved and and doing it good. They had a three part harmony, and they had audition for the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville and passed. And they they had a offer for a recording contract. I said, Dad, did y'all ever make a record? He said, Well, we paid five dollars and went in a radio station and did a disc, you know, direct to disc recording. Uh, but it's all scratchy. It was at my mom's house. So I'll get it restored someday. But um, but what I was going to say about the record contract? He said, Yeah, we were offered a record contract. I said, Well, why didn't you do it? He said. Well, there's seven of us in the band, and they only offered three percent. And I said no, so that you know. But he never got a chance anyway because volunteered for the war. You know, either volunteer or you get called. You didn't have a choice. Absolutely. You, had, you know, so that's the world he grew up in, and the world I. I want to. I want to just be clear. When you were a young boy watching these guys, it was. It was pedal steel, upright bass. Was there what was the instrumentation of the band? My dad played a Gibson mandolin, wow. sang tenor. Wow. Uh, they had a Martin auditorium size acoustic guitar. Right. And uh, there's a fiddle player. I don't know what kind of fiddle he played. So, um, you know, that was it. I think. It was seven cats uh, in the band? Did you have just a couple harmony singers? Was there? There wasn't a trap set, was there? No, no, me and I don't think so. Me and not me, my dad and two brothers. They sang together harmony, three part harmony. This is the most beautiful thing, Spooner. This is bringing me. This is so emotional. I mean, I re, do you remember? Um, I know Bill Monroe used to um, require that his. Um, band members wear shirt and tie uh to the uh concerts and they you know guys that were younger maybe even considered uh hippies to a degree they always questioned why and and he said that that when he was playing to the cats in in the south in alabama appalachia you know this was like church for them do you remember like were there stalwart bluegrass musicians uh, that you got to even see as a young boy that had a profound impact on you. No, my dad, he, he talked about Bill Monroe. I didn't know. I wasn't around a lot of bluegrass players, although there's Jake Landers down here later. He, sure. He's written a couple of hits and uh, had a band for years. But there were bands around, but I was too young to go see them, basically, uh, you know. I didn't have many recordings back in the days I was growing up, but no, I didn't. I, I'll tell you, you spoke of Tucson. There's a friend of mine, Linda Ronstadt, lives there, oh my and God. I played in her first solo album and did a tour with her. And uh, why did I bring that up? I had something well, on my no, mind be, well, because of you. Oh, she. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, she. She. She uh, introduced me to my first bluegrass festival I ever went to. Which is a band called uh, Seldom Seen. Oh my God! They, they, you know, they were like doctors and lawyers and such. <laughs> they were really good, you know. But oh man! I, so that's what I'm saying. I wasn't exposed to a whole lot early, except through the radio, I guess. Well, why then? I w- I do want to ask you though, if you can talk about the first time that uh, that that your God entered your life. Oh, I was young. I, my, I remember when I, I, you know, accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior kind of thing, and I, uh, it was a Baptist revival out in the country, and my uncle, Alan Oldham, was the preacher. And when, you know, all the Southern kind of revivals, they would end their little message and sermon with, uh, you know, we'll invite you to come. I forget the word, but, you know, come on up and accept Jesus kind of thing. And I did that one night. And, uh, and it, you know, it's emotional response. And uh, uh, so 
sort of a widening of my mind in a sense that uh, I didn't feel, I mean, I felt responsible for my action, but I thought, that, you know, there's a bigger power than myself, so I'll depend on that occasionally, you know. Just because, you know, and like, I like I mean, you talk, like, because I, I really love the way you, you know, you, you didn't have a lot of records, you didn't, you know, you weren't exposed to a lot of, there wasn't a big touring circuit you know you basically it was family and then like i just wonder about how you developed your personal relationship with the divine would you communicate with the with your with with the, with the lord i mean and as a boy would you would you talk and i just wonder if there was a time when uh when you surrendered uh because something happened where there was an intervention of some sort and uh, and you couldn't explain it logically what happened, but it proved to you that that source and 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 your God were very much real. No, basically, I just you know prayed at night, go to bed, and uh, and say you know, Lord, uh, forgive me if I've sinned. Uh, hopefully, I haven't. But uh, and you know, keep us safe. I never talked about politics or religion period zero yeah no i feel that i it's gotten so no. uh it's got it that that part of it um has really sort of i i just love talking to cats like you who just lived and tried to stay on the righteous path i i'm also like mm. i'm just a little bit con i mean i'm just baffled and blown away uh when you did get of age um did you wind up on a like? Are you familiar with the Chitlin circuit? Uh, where did you wind? Yeah, I, yeah. I've heard about it, and I know a lot of, especially blues and black uh, artists, uh, survived that route and went that route. And that was one of the few available uh, venues to go to. Is, uh, but no, I heard about it. I don't think I ever was a part of that. I'm, I'm 77. Next week I'll be 78 years old. Yo, but, happy birthday, Spoon uh, man! Th thank you, but I never. I, I would hear about those things in the movies and the TV, but like everyone else, I didn't know what it meant really. You know, I did. I figured, it, you know, I figured it meant southern, mostly states, concert gigs at nightclubs or whatever. Can you talk or, as best you can about uh, how? I mean, your career. It just. I mean, I'm just all this incredible, authentic R and B, Sam and Dave. Aretha. No, well, I didn't play with Sam and Dave. Sorry. I'm sorry. Are there, you, you, it's well, it lists you as, uh, as a composer, but that might be a mistake. Oh yeah, they did do a song or two of mine. They did as a rough songwriter. Yeah. So so no, let, I'm sorry. Will, Wilson Pickett. How did you wind up at Fame, or was that done at Fame that in '66? Uh, you mean uh, what song you're speaking of? I'm looking or, here the ex the exciting the exciting Wilson Pickett on Atlantic. It 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 has yeah. You. I played on all that all that album. Yeah, uh, Mustang Sally, uh, Land of a Thousand Dances, and many many more with Wilson. And he uh, he was a fireball. You know he he came he he grew up in Alabama uh, somewhere down near Birmingham. I learned later, but uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this documentary called Muscle Shows, but it has a little overview of that time. Um, uh, but it's, it looks good and sounds good, that documentary. But uh, I, I was pretty young when all that was happening, as he was also. I mean, we were early 20s years old, I think. And well, the reason I ask is so, because I, I, I'm just, I'd like you to talk a little bit about, like, it looks like part of the album was done at, in, in, at Stax or whatever satellite records, and then part of it was done at Muscle Shoals. How did you just, how did you connect with, with those? Those are two of the heaviest regional studio recording scenes of all time. Could you just talk about how you connected with those guys? I never connected with Stax Records. I got a lot of friends with Booker T, Steve Cropper. Donald Duck Dunn, Duck Dunn, yeah. Yeah, Duck Dunn. He and I played on a Neil Young tour together. And a oh, my God. I love, oh, I have know, heard that, dude. I never had a thing to do with Stax Records, although fame, uh, 
Rodney Hall, the studio manager today, uh, Rick Hall's son, that Rick Hall passed away a couple years ago, but he showed me a picture recently of me, his mother, uh, Linda Hall, and his aunt in front of a, we were walking around fame, but it was like a concrete pad for a building to be put up. So I was there early. I, I call myself the second generation house band at fame. Now, the first generation house band at fame was David Briggs, Norbert Putnam, Jerry Kerrigan, Peanut Montgomery, Jr. Lowe. And and on the first two hits out of that studio, Still Away by Jimmy Hughes and uh, You Better Move On by Arthur Alexander, I played overdubbed organ. That's the first time I'd overdubbed an instrument. So. Oh, my. Dude, you're so, blown. So was, Dude, was, you was, just blew. Wait, hold on. This is amazing. So uh, Johnson, Hood, Roger, rest in peace. They were second generation. And you you just said the uh, Well, actually, uh, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. So the first generation Briggs, Norbert Putnam, I just connected with him. Uh, he he played with Elvis, I think. He played bass with Elvis. Oh, well, yeah, a long time, yeah. And he still does. He doesn't play with Elvis. But they still do, <laughs> no, they do Elvis tribute shows in Europe a lot. He and David, you know. Still so do that. so how? So let's just try to you know how did you how did get, get into connected to, to fame? fame? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well. Uh, Rick Hall, he'd built a little studio, not fame, well, I don't know what he called it, but it's out on a old, used to be a tobacco warehouse on Wilson Down Road, and it was just, uh, he was getting started up, really, he started a publishing company, song publishing company, and he was doing demos of new songs people locally had written, and I'd get, I'd play on those. I, it was actually before I started songwriting, I think. And Holy cow! So and uh, but you know then, I think, you know, like I said, at Fame, I had already played on their two hits, even though I wasn't employed. Uh, so eventually, uh, Dan Penn and myself, we signed, I think, a three-year contract with Fame to be songwriters for that company. Uh, they would publish, we would write, and and in the process, I became a keyboard player also because, you know, I, I was, David Briggs had moved to Nashville along with Norbert and Jerry Kerrigan, and they had a great career in Nashville all these years uh, as session players and song publishers and whatever. But um, they went to yeah, they went I, to they went couple, to they went to Sun Sun Records. Is that where they went? No, no, uh, Nashville. Na uh, Sons in Memphis. Sons. So, so what were they went to? So they meant they left Fame and went to Nashville, and you came in and start and you were hired on staff as a songwriter at Fame. Correct. Yeah. And you had uh, and so that's this is fantastic. Now tell me, Spooner. I mean, as best you can. I mean. So many iconic songs. I mean, how did at least the germ of a song, the the the, the root? I mean, does, do do things come to you and just fall through you in one time? How, can you talk about when you knew you had the the gift of being able to write powerful lyrics? Well, I don't know. You know, uh, one of uh, my first interest in this potential songwriter was in the basement at my mom's house and dad's house and there was a little upright piano down there and I'd I'd go down there and if I was a, probably 16 and I would write these puppy love kind of love stories and, <laughs> and I'd put the lyric in the piano bench and never play them to anybody well I decided I'd play it to my sister Judy who sang a bit and she learned one of them and and but that was my introduction, really, to the possibility of songwriting. Later, Dan Penn showed up. He moved up. He and Linda Penn, they moved up from Vernon, Alabama, to Florence, Alabama. And, and like I said, he, he saw me recall. And somehow, one we decided to try to write a song together because he had already written a song called "As a Bluebird Blue" that that Conway Twitty had had a hit on. And so I'm thinking, well, he's a songwriter. He's had some, even though he was like 16 or 17. And 
so we you know try to write together and i think we did write something neither one of us know what it was the first time we got together i don't think we captured it really but we saw that the possibility of us writing together and we continued through the years and uh you know uh uh young songwriters asked dan these days he told me recently said these young songwriters asked me how do i write a song what do you do do you write from personal experiences or he said, "Just make something up." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you have to have you have to have like ex- it's very hard to. I mean, you write a song about. Uh, I mean, you just have to have depth, and you have to have some a story to tell. You have to. It's through your life experience, and I think my younger generations, you know, it's just it's hard to it's hard to write when you're living in suburbia and you're not really feeling adversity or the burn or or you know overcoming so i mean your dad is a perfect example i mean here's a guy again i mean he was playing music his intentions for playing were to inspire other people but then he volunteered winds up coming back is really the, from the war never the same person can't play music again i mean just that alone not that he was writing songs about that but that is just sacrifice and i just don't well, I- yeah he was so uh, pleased and proud of me and my efforts in music. I was glad because, you know, he didn't it because of his circumstances or he didn't, you know. So that was good. I grew up in that environment that he was, are you there? I think I'll my power. Hang on. Yeah. No, I hear you. Oh, yeah. Let me try this other phone. Can oh, you, you sound really now? good, man. I guess my the cordless Oh, that sounds... Battery-powered phone went out, so I got another one. You know, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> oh, Spooner, man. I got I want to just get this out of the way. I, I, I'm pre- I just, I have this dream that, um, you know, that that you were. Did you have a chance? Did you get off on and and get a chance to? There were the the organ players that I love: Jack McDuff, Richard Groove Holmes, Jimmy Smith. Those guys all kick pedals you know they they played the bass lines with their feet a lot of cats uh they just play with their left hand did you did you have any exposure to the great soul jazz players uh the the organ players who kicked pedals and did you in fact ever kick pedals i, I never played pedals although i, I saw like once or twice in a nightclub maybe uh where where it's usually a black soul player that would play organ and pedals, and, and usually nobody else playing with them sometimes, but they could really make a lot of sounds, and I was impressed by it. But I never, my my early entrance into recording um, with great bass players, I, I realized I need, you know, they need space. Nobody ever said don't play the pedals or anything <laughs> like that, but, but that that's the bass player's deal. And and when you got a rhythm section, you know. Oh my god, dude! I, when you're playing, like, the, yeah. oh my god! I mean the or, but I mean you you so you used to go into a, a soul, a black club, and you'd see a cat just playing organ and bass with his feet, and it was like generating. Maybe was there a drummer? Because for a while it was just organ and drums. I don't remember that part. I just remember watching the guy. Play the pedals and the keyboard. It was fantastic. I was moved by it, you know. But I never wanted to go there because they were already so good at it. And like I said, I got into the recording world so early as a teenager that I didn't need to play pedals and didn't want to because the electric bass player or the acoustic bass player was doing that part. You know what I mean? So you can't have two bass parts going. I'm curious about the when you talk early on i mean it looks to me that aretha arrives your career basically started 60 667 who were david like who were the acoustic bass players that that you were in the studio with well there weren't many uh a junior low but he didn't play it in the studio maybe once or twice it wasn't a and then norbert putnam played acoustic but they had all gravitated to the electric bass by the time they got in the studio you know interesting who was the first cat you said jimmy low 
Junior, like J J U N I O. Sure. Junior. Um, Albert Lowe is the way his real name, but uh, yeah, he play. Actually, he played bass with me and Roger Hawkins on When a Man Loves a Woman by uh, Percy Sledge, you know, <laughs> fifty years ago. Wow. Uh, so, so that was electric bass, you know. Am I naive to think that? Uh, I mean, you said you overdubbed a couple of early songs when you were kind of an unknown when before you were hired as a staff writer at fame. Um, how often were you guys all hitting in the, like, just, just take, you know, these Aretha albums, like how often was everybody hitting in the, in the room at the same time? Or, or I mean, I, I have this fantasy that cause everything today is so, I mean, because of the convenience of technology, you can email parts, so you can overdub, and, and there's so much emphasis on post-production. And I just wonder about the amount of time, if you can recall a, 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 how often in the studio you guys all hit live at the same time. We, 99% of the time, we're all a rhythm section at the same time, playing with the singer, live vocals. So they typically would be a vocalist, uh, artist, uh, piano, bass, drums, guitar. Those were always there at the same time. And then we had a little process. Some, if it, the thing needed a horn, sometimes they'd come later. Sometimes they'd be there. If it were, we would uh, immediately, well, they could play along with us or overdub whatever they wanted. And then the background vocals, if you chose to use those later, you could overdub those, but the rhythm section was always together. And, always. And but but as far as uh, you know, for instance, like my God, like Diane Ross. I mean, would they actually would they be singing with the rhythm or section, or would the rhythm section lay it down first, or were the vocals already cut and you were playing to their vocal? How would that all work? I don't know what Motown did. I, I was. I went there recently in the building, you know, everybody's gone. But, Hell yeah. Uh, yeah. But I'm just like you. I'm, I am mean, look, I don't know what went on there. I wasn't there. And I hadn't heard anybody tell a lot of stories about what went on there, you know. Well, I guess maybe maybe that wasn't the, the I, I think maybe more to the point like uh, with, with Wilson or Aretha, um, were, were, were they, were, were the vocal lead vocals already cut when you when the rhythm section no no we, they sang with us every time never a separate never separate can you talk about the magic that occurs when everybody's hitting together i mean i i mean again radio was very um elastic at that time there were a lot of bleed through channels i mean you got your start in music i think spooner because not only well, there were hit records that were played on the radio, but everybody was in the studio, no baffles. I don't know if Roger was even in a drum booth. Can you talk about some of these early sessions that were so stripped down, but they're songs that stand out, that hold up better today maybe than they did then? Well, I don't know. I think all of we players and writers probably deep down had the thought, well, hopefully we're doing a song or record that withstand the test of time and then and the longer it lasts the better and the more durable we've done something worthwhile so that wasn't surprised anybody i don't think but we our tent was good um in some cases there were baffles to separate the bass amp or i think uh, there's a while roger was behind a little screen uh, drum booth we call it but in the case of uh, the other studio across the river, I mean, another town, Sheffield, where Quinby's studio was, uh, Percy Sledge, that was the first record out of that studio, and it, I don't think it had any baffles. So just me and Roger and Percy and uh, uh, Marlon Green overdubbed a country gentleman Gretz guitar immediately. Wow. Uh, and let's see, then the bass was junior low. I think we were all open open air, but you know, everything has possibilities. There's no <laughs> and each and each producer, each recording engineer may have personal preferences, so 
in that case, we players just go along with whatever they want, you know. Well, I just want to be, I also, this is important. Um, you're saying that, uh, that, sh- that, that the sledge when a man loves a woman was not done at Muscle Shoals Sound. It was done at, at Sheffield Studios. It was done in a studio called Norala, which means North Alabama, and then it later became Quinby uh, because the owner manager was Quinn Ivy, producer, and his his partner was Marlon Green, who played the guitar part on Percy's record. Um, so that was their first recording, I think. Uh, that studio and a little far piece of red Italian instrument, I think they'd borrowed from somebody because they'd probably, I don't know if they'd run out of money or time or, but I walked in the studio, somebody called me and come in there, will you play keyboards? Sure, on this new recording of Hospital Orderly and, uh, yeah, yeah, first time in the studio and I walk in a little red shiny Italian far piece of organ and, it only had two buttons, like a multi-tone booster and, and some other button, and I powered up the big Ampeg amp, amplifier beside me. The red light comes on, powers up. I power the organ up, push the off and on button, uh, push one of those two buttons, and it sounded like a thousand screaming bumblebees. <laughs> and I, I, I hated it. I said, this will never work because I'm thinking... I know it's a soul singer, I can tell but just looking at him, you know. Sure. It's not going to be a teeny bopper thing. And uh, so I push the other button, and it's, a re- it's a sound we hear on When a Man Loves a Woman recording. You know, I, my heart sort of settled into the record song then, easy, you know. But I think they'd borrowed it from somebody, that organ. You, um, do you did you meet... Uh, did you meet the Almonds when they were the Almond Joys? Or, I know you played on the Hourglass album. I mean, how did you connect with Hornsby and 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 Sandlin and the Almond Brothers? I didn't really know uh, Paul Hornsby and, and Johnny Sandlin so much back then, but uh, I'm trying to think. Well, I think they must have heard mine and Dan's song "Power of Love." Sure, uh, maybe I did. I, I don't know. And they'd record it. I didn't play on that record, but they'd use that song. That's the only thing I know about all that, really. That I, get, I don't know how they heard the song. I don't remember if we sent it to them or they found it at Fame. But so we had a whole stack of songs there at Fame at that time, you know. So they, the Hourglass covered the song. Um, did you wind up crossing paths with? With Dwayne Allman, uh, Sky Dog, at some point. Yeah, I mean, he he was a, I'm trying to remember. There's a little difference in time frame, but I I was saw him once at the Fame, and uh, he they just built Studio B, which wasn't there most of my time there earlier in the 60s, 70s, and he said, "Let's go in there. We don't need anybody there that day." Let's, he had his guitar and. Went, be play some piano. Well, I got this song I want to show you, and so we played it. I don't remember if he recorded. It. I don't think he recorded. It. But anyway, no, so it did. No, it, the, you're, you're you're on the anthology, the Dwayne Allman anthology. I don't know what song, but it, it definitely yeah, did get diff- recorded. Yeah, I think it's a different song. But anyway, mm, I got to hang out with him that day, and ride, he rode around my car, and we <laughs> talked. I, I could tell he was. Uh, I liked him, and I could tell he was in, in, very intelligent and obviously a great player. So, But I wasn't around him a whole lot. Uh, uh, I know my friend, uh, after I moved to Los Angeles area, got married to Karen in, in the 68 or 69, and and I got uh, down the road was a friend, uh, Delaney Bramlett, who had already been down all those rock and roll roads and with Delaney and Bonnie and friends and been to Europe as a band. And uh, so I went over to his house and we started writing songs together. And he, he told me that Dwayne had given him a guitar and uh, Harris, George Harrison had given him a guitar and Eric Clapton had given him a guitar. So, you know. But he knew more about Wayne Dwayne than I did. Sure. No, you. But did you know you knew Delaney 
uh, prior? Before? Very well, very well. Not before. You got to it know. It was after he divorced uh, Bonnie. He, they two, I think that's when I met him, probably. You talk but a, we had yeah. a we had a communication because he I learned he grew up in the Pontotoc, Mississippi, and we had that southern you know Alabama Mississippi connection musically in our heads and and then um, you know I got him to talk about his early days as much as I could uh, so I learned a lot about his travels you know. Was there over? Was there similarities with the way you guys were raised at all, or did he have a, compl a different kind of upbringing? Well, I don't know about. I didn't, didn't learn anything about where he lived and how he lived and his upbringing, but I did learn had similar paths. Except, I mean, he was a. He told me one day, he said, "You heard that record by the Champs, Tequila?" Oh, sure. That's, I think that's the number one instrumental record of all time. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, he said I, I play. He said I played guitar on that uh, that record, and so he was in Los Angeles a long time, and he played on a show called uh, Shindig, and that was like Leon Russell. All those session guys, it might even been Kelton. I don't. I never asked him who played drum, but anyway, they had real good players, and they'd bring in different singers and. They'd play along with them, you know, it was a TV weekly show. So they got spirits there, and they got spirits in studio. So I, we had a similar studio experience, although he had a different experience than me. He was uh, touring with band and getting in front of audiences a lot, you know. That's what I was going to ask you is that what was the – because you were dwelling in, at, in the studios at Fame and Muscle Shoals – do you remember the first tour that you went out on to, to promote a record? I, I well, I, I didn't really do it. Well, I, uh, I'm I'm confused about time frame myself, but I did s several tours by now. But uh, one was Richard Betts and uh, oh, Dickie Betts. Holy and, cow! And, and then one with Linda Ronstadt. Those were the two first tours I did, and. Uh, yeah, I remember them both well, you know. Can you talk about what it was like to be... The road can eat, you, eat people up, but, I mean, you were just playing... You were serving the song... I think you served the song about as well as any musician I've ever talked to, and I just wonder what it was like well, for... Oh, thank you. Yeah. No, well, what, what, what was the experience like with on the road? Dickie was doing a solo album, maybe, uh... Like, yeah, you know, he had been with the Almond Brothers, and uh, he did a solo album for Capricorn Records in uh, Macon, Georgia. And I got a call from, uh, I think it was Phil Walden, who was the record company. Absolutely. Guys. Yeah. And would I go on the road with Dickie Betts? And they had Vassar Clements, who's a great fiddle player. And uh, Wait, don't uh, even tell me that you hung with Vassar. Oh yeah, we were uh, on dude. Tour please, together. I yeah, dude. Yeah. Uh, Vassar Clemens is. I mean, dude. The guy could say four words, and it was the most profound four words of all. I mean, he just. Can you please talk about Vassar? He is so in my soul, man. I cannot believe that you and him were on. Well, yeah. yeah, well, I, I didn't talk a lot or hang out a lot with anybody, uh, <laughs> but I did get to know him, you know, through the music playing and. Uh, Oh, I mean, by the time we played a gig and rode down the road and got in a hotel, I, you know, I was done for the day. I uh, did. <laughs> so, no, uh, I understand. But he, he was a nice guy to me and uh, vice versa, and uh, I didn't learn a lot about his past. I just I saw him play like a jewel, you know. He was he was great. When you uh, when you um. Like, can you just talk about what the what the motive was, or maybe the story of how you wound up moving to L.A.? I can tell a little bit about that. Uh, I kept getting phone calls in Alabama. Um, Joe Wilson is a friend of mine that, uh, well, he's got a storied career. He was a, like a recording engineer, and he played some keyboards, and he was from Atlanta. Jeez. 
and uh, I think he hung out with the Classics Four and, and Buddy Boo and those people. Uh, Bill Lowry had a studio in Atlanta at the time. Anyway, uh, before I go too deep there, uh, let's see. Uh, he kept calling, saying these people are. They bought this little funky building for Mike Curb. It was called Sidewalk Productions, and, and they're going to make it in the recording studio. And people are getting together to do this. Is uh, Emory Gordy Jr. who plays bass. He's from Atlanta. He's he's been um, he wrote a song called uh, Traces, uh, and he's a ranger and a bass player. And also a guy named Dennis St. John has been in Roy Orbison's band playing sure. drum. Wow. And. Uh, so Richard Bennett, teenager guitar player out in L.A., he's going to be in the group. So we, we need you to play keyboards, uh, if you will. And there'd be a little weekly salary, and you can play all over town if you want to, long, you know, as long as you don't have something to do in that studio. So we put that studio together, tested microphones, built baffles, play stuff, and I did my only one and only album in 1973. There, I found it the uh, other day, man. I bought it for five bucks. I was like, I cannot believe Spooner did it. You were a leader at that. I love Potluck. Huh? It's, it, well, it's called like Potluck, right? Yes, that's correct. I, I, it's I, been reissued recently, uh, recently on uh, CD. No, I found the uh, original record. on LP though. It's unbelievable, yeah. Spooner. I mean. So you're telling me so this cat Wilson calls you up, and it's called Sidewalk Studios. They were going to refurbish it, and you guys basically came in that group as session cats. Uh, yeah. Okay, and yeah. then and, and songwriters. Yeah. And, and so and so, guy. but it, this was different than. And what year was this? Seventy one. I don't know. Yeah, maybe uh, 71, 72, 73. I was there, and. Uh, it's called Producer's Workshop, what it became immediately. Called. Absolutely. It's still there, wow. still working studio. I don't know who owns it now, but... Because I'm looking here, it's like, it. it's like uh, Mark McClure, Gene Clark, uh, the Everly Brothers. I mean, when you first got in there, you didn't know any of these other cats, St. John or these other no. guys personally. Like, what, like... Bobby Bridger, Ron Stat, uh, Jackson Brown. Like when these cats would, how would it work? Would you get the, would you get uh, the 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 sheet music? Well, maybe you were writing some of it, but a lot of times I know, like with David T. Walker, Wilton Felder, and Ed Green, like with with Barry White, uh, Gene Page would just give them a chord chart, and maybe the drummer he'd give them a little bit of a tip on like kind of the way the rhythm should sound. But then they were kind of able to sort of just do their own thing. I mean, can you talk about how you guys, I mean, the song-making process, I don't need to explain this to you, but Spooner, I mean, everything was predicated on pre-production. And now in today's world, because the technology is so superior and you can fix all these blemishes. Uh, I, I, I beg to disagree about technology is so superior. I prefer analog to digital. I, I, no, no, no. That's I agree with you. No, I'm with you. Yeah. I, what I mean is that, no, and it's, I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm saying the technology has gotten to a point where you can fix things and make a pop singer who can't even perform live uh, yeah. make them a star. I'm saying it's not a good thing. I'm just saying, yeah. that, just if you could talk a little bit about not knowing those guys, not having a trust, but then over time building a producer workshop and building songs for these cats. I mean, would, would would they come in with songs and then you would play them or were you basically writing songs for the leaders of these, of that of these albums? Oh, there's all various ways of going about, but my story was moving to Los Angeles and getting married to Karen. We're now 51 years. Bless her. Bless you guys. Man. Dude, you, dude, you are, and, uh, and you got 51 more left. Hopefully. Uh, but, uh, the thing is, uh, there's a guy, a man from Meridian, Mississippi, originally living out in Los Angeles when I moved out there, named Chris Etheridge. Sure. 
and I got to be friends with him. He had come out of a band called uh, Flying Burrito Brothers, mm. and he'd also, well, in the latter years now, lately, he played in Willie Nelson's band, bass player for like 15, 20 years, and he he died a couple years ago. But anyway, when I got out there, I think it was that Southern Connection. He had stopped by Fame Studio as an 18-year-old player, met me and Dan there, and moved out to Los Angeles. Well, I uh, asked him later, I said, well, what took you to L.A. from Mississippi? He said, Johnny Rivers took me out there to play in his band. Wow. But anyway, Dan, uh Chris would say to me, he said, I'm getting calls to play on sessions, bass player. And I told him, yeah, I'd do it if Spooner Oldham could go with me. <laughs> so he helped me a lot, but just he he actually probably re- introduced me to a lot of those Southern California rock and roll folk artists, uh, you know, all those people. The birds. Well, at least yeah. at least a couple of them. And one thing, if you do good work, I always figure good one good thing leads to another. So you know, you, well, I mean, you're that, that's you're, the way that happened. Yeah, you're an example. Boy, so I, I just want to be clear. Wilson called you for the for the sidewalk, which eventually became the producer's workshop. And then once you got out there, Etheridge took you into a whole new vector of musicians. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. You Unbelievable. Know, from, yeah, I, I became all over the place. I worked at all the studios. I don't think I missed a studio in Los Angeles. Not that I don't think you can name one I haven't played in. <laughs> what about, you know? I mean, what, what, yeah, no, so can you tell me a class? I mean, like... I know I talked to Randy Brecker, the great trumpet player, and he would go from, uh, you know, a rehearsal with Ornette Coleman, and then he'd be in the studio with Johnny Cash doing mariachi horns. I mean, can you, I mean, what was a magical studio day for Spooner Oldham? Like, and also, you didn't have cartage, so, I mean, how, would you just have to play whatever dog de jour organ they had, or how would that work if you just showed up somewhere without your, without your rig? <laughs> Well, uh, in my case, in my early teenage years, I thought, well, I want to be in the music business, so what's the easy instrument to get around with? Uh, I, I thought, well, it's either harmonica or a piano. Everybody's got a piano. Right. And you put a harmonica in my pocket. So it's called lazy. Uh, <laughs> I was born lazy. I don't and, think uh, so, dude. You know, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, my attitude is very lazy. I mean, I, I get the work done and I do what I need to do, but otherwise, I, my wife tries to get me to work more in the flower garden, and I have trouble getting out there and doing it. Well, I don't blame you. You're not motivated to do it. No, I mean, listen, the, <laughs> but I mean, like... Well, studios, they all have piano and organ, right? Right, you know, that's right. Part, that's part of the... To get anybody to rent your studio, how would you do it? you got to have a piano and organ. So I didn't have to worry about good instruments because they'd already checked them out a hundred times and tuned them and, you know. So I didn't care anything. Yeah, so you didn't – so, I mean, because I remember talking to Joe. Did you ever cross paths with Joe Sample? I don't think so. I know about him, you know. Yeah, no, because he – we- weather, weather report. No, no, uh, like jazz, cru- no. jazz Crusaders. Jazz Crusaders. Yeah, yeah. He he used to talk about being on the again being on the road, uh, and this is you know you were obviously like you said you didn't really hit the road until with Dicky and Linda Ronstadt, but he would walk into these clubs and he's like, what kind of dog du jour piano do I got to play tonight? Some of the black keys might be missing, uh, you know, and yet sometimes he was able to just through his own spirit and life force get the most amazing sound out of the crappiest piano and i wonder um you know if you well yeah i think you can do that that's that, i never had that i remember one instance with jj kell he had a studio in uh, uh, north hollywood uh, leased for a while a building and and we, me and Tim Drummond and Jim Keltner would go over there and play sometimes. And uh, uh, he had an old—I didn't play it on the record, but he had an old upright piano in the corner. And one day I was playing it a little bit. 
He said, "That thing's so out of tune, but you're playing it in tune." <laughs> I think you, I think you can play an instrument in, into tune if you want to. It takes effort, you know. Well, no, and you just called yourself lazy, yeah. and that 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 can't be a lazy person's job. So what I'm saying <laughs> is, like, um, I want. Can you just spiritually talk about? McCoy Tyner would agree with you. He said the same thing. He would bang a piano back into tune. I mean, how did you do that? That is that a spirit? Is that? Well, be- why would you want to do that? I don't even want to talk about it. It sounds real work, like attitude to, to get that sound. But it's just a God-given talent to do that. You can't teach that, you know. Mm-hmm. When you would, uh, when you, I, I, I must correct myself. I said I never carried an instrument. I carried a a Wurlitzer electric piano and a. What they call it, a flight case? Yeah, yeah. On that tour, that's what I play. On which tour? Linda Ronstadt. Ron, you know, because a lot of the look like a lot of cats. Again, I would have just my dream is like I woke up this morning. I'm like Spooner. My dream is to see Spooner like walking into a, a, a club on the Lower East Side of Manhattan with a Fender Rhodes over his back. I mean, a lot of guys were like. In the jazz, oh, yeah. in the jazz scene in New York, I mean, they, 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 they. By the time they got in the cab, hauled the Fender Rhodes over there, put it up, played, got their five or ten bucks for the night, got the cab back home. I mean, it was like you barely even made anything, you know. It was like it, well, that's a Fender Rhodes, a heavy instrument. I didn't, I wouldn't play one in the eighties because there was a lot of hit records on the radio that used that instrument. And I, I wouldn't play it. I mean, I never told anybody I don't play that, but I mentally would not get near one. Now I can play one because nobody's playing them. You know? I, I And I, I it's interesting you said the 80s because in the early 70s when it, they had the suitcase model and it was just that sound coming out of it is just, you play like a Leslie speaker through it. I'm just curious, like, when you... When you got into the studios and Etheridge was cooking the groove and getting you all, I mean, you were ensconced in all these different places. Where would you go, you know, with with all these cats just to jam? Would you go to Topanga? Was there a club that you would go to, like, just to get no, stuff out I of No, I, I don't jam. I never have. Uh, so, so I, you know, other people do it, and, and they live for it, and uh, love it. Uh, but you said you went over... I don't even think I ever yeah. attended a jam. No, but I mean, oh, like, with, Kel- with Keltner, that, Keltner and Tim Drummond, like, you guys would just go to play. That was just at somebody's studio. Yeah, we'd play a gig, a venue, a record, or, or a concert. We didn't go anywhere just to play, to my, to my memory, you know. I can't remember that. Spooner, I got one more thing to play i got one thing to play for you and then we'll we'll put a wrap on this set okay okay all right spiritual thing is is basically when you're playing and it's just not bebop this is other music too but bebop is in jazz is probably that's the high end of what we do mm-hmm. as jazz musicians but but just the spirituality comes from it's it's like it's like something now this this may sound abstract but it's something that Wayne shorter said to me one time he said that the only way you can really, really, really play is that you have to go to the store and buy some milk for your grandmother. You know, <laughs> and when he said that to me and the drummer, Omar Hakim, now he had a few few drinks, a few old drinks. Right. I said, wow. But a couple <laughs> days later it hit me, you know, because, you know, it's like to come, if you have one of those kind of families, you go to see your grandmother, she says, go to the store and get me some milk. And you go there. There's a love. There's a there's something. There's a love for something other than just what you're looking at. It's like your own personal love, which you know, which could come from God, which could come from the force of, of life. It could be whatever it is that makes you that you think makes you tick. Mm-hmm. That if you tap into that, whatever that is, it's not it's not a material. It's not the instrument. It's not the notes. It's it's the life force. It's this. It's it, and that is very when you operate on that band, that's uh that's or on that uh, frequency in life. That is very spiritual. Um, Spooner, that was my first interview with the bass player Stanley Clark, who was in uh, most notably Return to Forever, 
and he was talking about um, the you know sort of the antecedents to to playing spiritual music in any genre, and I I just wanted you to talk a little bit about what he was talking about. It's like this uh, unconditional devotional love, like it's going to the store to get your grandma some milk. Everybody operating on that frequency, and when I hear you guys on that Dylan tour, Freddie Tackett. Drummond, Keltner, you, and Bob, it sounds like that kind of frequency. And I just kind of wanted you to talk, if that quote, if that audio I just played you resonated with you. Oh, yeah, it's good to hear Stanley Clark and his reasoning for feeling attached to the music. Um, I'm sure I can relate. I'm sure anyone can relate to that. Um, I, I don't know. It's, it's, I, I can't really talk about it. I'm not going to expand on that because I don't know the answer. If I knew the answer, I'll tell you. <laughs> no, I just think um, that, like, when... Can you talk about playing with Bob? I mean, I know that Fred to- told me, you know, uh, it was a very interesting time because you had, he was never part of the, you know, the Bill Graham. He was never appealing to the Crusades or Bill Graham people and bob wasn't uh, you know and then there were old dylan fans who who would hold up signs saying jesus loves your old songs too you know it was a very interesting set i just wanted you to to relay your thoughts about you know that those those live shows because i'm telling you man i mean they are burning burning music and and you're a big part of it well uh we uh Rehearsed, I don't know, three weeks in Santa Monica learning the uh, Slow Train Coming songs. I didn't play on that album. The Saved album, I did play on that album. So we were doing those two uh, albums worth of material on the concerts, uh, and we learned all those. And and Karen, and my wife, we'd stay down there at the little hotel on the beach, and, and my daughter was three or four, and... Uh, Roxanne, and then we'd hang out with uh, the Gina McClary Havis at that time, Tony, their little son, and in the afternoon after we finished, well, uh, one day on the steps after we finished rehearsing, I said to Tim Drummond, the bass player friend, I said, what's Bob Dylan really like? And he said, uh, well, you know, he's in his hotel room a lot, he's on the phone, and that sort of blew my a preconceived bubble, you know, like I'm thinking, well, he's a, he's a big music star and he's been around a long time and he probably doesn't want to talk to anybody. If anybody calls, he'd probably say, you know, tell him I'm busy or whatever. <laughs> that was that was my thought. For sure, him. sure, sure, uh, sure. You know, because he had so much going on. and But he, uh, anyway, so later we got out on the road and the first gig we were sold out at the Warfield Theater in San Francisco, Bill Graham's newly renovated building. Absolutely. And it was sold out for two weeks uh, before we touched the stage, you know. So, But uh, as we drove up in the band, as a band and him, he and uh, uh, there's a bunch of, I'd say, 20, 21-year-old looking people, boys and girls, out on the sidewalk with these placards, you know, like, and I think what it was was basically uh, the Jewish religion, sure. Judaism, mm-hmm. was protesting him becoming a Christian. I guess was sort of the essence of it, you know. I can imagine. And, yes. uh, mm-hmm. and I found that sort of interesting. But and uh, then we'd play a gig, and some I know some nutcase jumped up on the stage wanting to talk Bible and. Bob later after it's over said, "Oh, let him up there. You know, I, I bring him on. You know, like he could talk. He, he could. <laughs> he wasn't worried about that kind of stuff. You know? Oh my God! He could talk to Bob with him. You know, Bob's like, let him up because Bob in the middle of the concert. You know. Well, he would say that like he Tackett said that. uh Bob said, "I don't, I don't trust those mega churches. He's like, I, I'm from the spirit church. You know, I mean, did it? It must have been." such a trip to i mean you can you just talk i mean it must have been so much fun to because that band electric dylan with those cats that band although keltner did say it took a minute for the band to gel though like most bands do 
Mm-hmm. But once, yeah, once we got connected and all on the same page, and we're playing, enjoying the music, playing the music, it was happening for us. I think in our brains and soul, and 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 the the audiences were, you know, except for the first two or three nights. I think that's the case with any kind of off the wall subject. Uh, the protesters will come the first two or three days to show their strength or to their, you know, adversity to what you're doing. Same with Neil Young when he was protesting the war. Sure. I played that tour, and I think there was, uh, I'm getting off the subject, but I remember one night they said 325 people bought tickets from a corporation in California just to show up protesting what we were doing. And then they left after about 10 minutes, but the seats were available, you know. Nobody cared what they thought. I just want to be clear, that was uh, the first Gulf War, early 90s? Uh, I think so. It's called a Freedom of Speech Tour. With Neil Young. I'll have to look that uh, no, up. No, it's Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. Crosby, it was a CSNY tour. Interesting. Y- yeah, yeah. Wow, I'll have to look that up. Yeah. Hey, uh, Spooner, I, do you think uh, I we're going to wrap this? You've been so gracious, but do you think that uh, on Thursday uh, at at one p.m. your time we could just finish up and do part two? I don't know. Let's talk tomorrow. I'm tired right now. Okay. Yeah. You. I'll call you tomorrow, and we'll uh, yeah. and we'll see what what what's going on. But I I just want to say it. I, I can't I can't thank you enough and I, I, I just want you to get in the flower bed today and do some do some work with the flowers. <laughs> <laughs> I need to uh you know, cut some weeds out of the flower bed. Yeah. Do something I you do, know, just I make do. your wife happy, man. Keep her happy, you know. Yeah, there you go. Amen. Amen. Thank S- you much that. love, Spooner. I'll I'll call you tomorrow. Take care. Peace All out, right. man. Later. Bye. See you. Later. Bye. Absolutely epic hang with Spooner Olden, amazing player, very matter-of-fact guy, very humble. Got some good stories out of him. Hopefully we'll do part two. We'll be back with Chuck Israels at the top of the hour. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. Peace.